Everybody, come in. We'll have a panel now. And my guest is Dominique Megre, head of Swiss Conventors. And I'm the founder of SIGTIC and the president. So let's look into Swiss venture capital in Switzerland. Please have a seat. Thank you, Thomas. So tell me about yourself. What's your educational background? And why did you actually move into venture capital? Well, I, I was raised and born in France, but had a European uh, journey, uh, essentially an entrepreneur trained as an economist. Uh, and I came to Switzerland 20 years ago, um, joined Swisscom, started Swisscom Ventures so uh, right, 15 years ago. When the internet bubble burst, you yeah, came just here? just about. I think I've done it. Uh, I've seen it as well, uh, 2001. Uh, so the, the, the idea for this book is, is essentially we've been fundraising the last five years for our external fund. You know, Swiss Conventions manages and advises 75% uh, of the three, 600 million we have in the management comes from third parties, uh, institutional investors. We've fundraised a first fund, 200 million, four years ago and a second fund, 300 million, just closed last month and about 20 uh, institutional investors. So when you pitch to pension funds, I'm not, it's like for you pitching to VCs, you've yes. got to train your argumentation, your storytelling, and it was all about Switzerland. And I, I, I really wanted so that's to... That's what's in this book, the Deep Tech Nation Switzerland. Some of you might be lucky later because I think he brought some of them. And if you're super lucky, you might even get the signature from him. Well, but you have to be at the booth right after our talk. And it is, it's a quite a, a long book, eh? almost you know, 300 something pages. You had time to write that while being a VC? That, that's a COVID <laughs> side effect, you know. When you get optimized on your traveling time. <laughs> I, I, I calculated, I, I was 15 to 20 hours saving every week because I live in uh, Romandie and I would typically travel three, four days a week. I saved that time, so I had to, to do something with it, and that's, I wrote a book. Um, essentially, it was about putting on paper the storytelling for the Switzerland venture capital case. And this is really important as a community, as a cluster, as an ecosystem, we need to have a story to tell to our investors. And that's obviously very important for venture capital funds, fundraising, but also for you uh, entrepreneurs, because you are part of this ecosystem. And as we all know, uh, branding a cluster is important. Like if you, if you are a cybersecurity company based in Israel, it's easier to brand and, and sell than if you are based in other countries. Silicon Valley, it's all about software at scale. And Switzerland is about deep technologies. So technologies derived from scientific innovation. So I thought I had to put it on paper to be convincing uh, in front of institutional investors. So when you go fundraising with pension fund and large corporates, you say, okay, read this first, and then if you want to invest, come to Swiss Conventures. <laughs> Do they actually read it? I mean, it's really on pages. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. I did it a posteriori. Um, eventually, I found out it's not about institutional investors only. I was surprised to see how little our top managers and uh, politicians in particular know about venture capital. They really get mixed up. Uh, you know, just, just make a, an, uh, as an example you can try. How many do know the difference between venture capital and private equity? Most of them don't. And hedge Let's funds. Say yes, the audience. Who knows the difference between private equity and venture capital? Raise your hand. Yeah, of course you do. But oh, you savvy people in the room. 80% know it. Don't take but it for, for granted. 20, for the other 20%, could you quickly explain maybe? Well, Those who didn't no, raise I mean, the hand. You, you all know what it is. What I'd like to say is, is venture capital is a unique asset class, a beautiful asset class, because its unique feature is to invest in primary in innovation. You don't do a secondary deal with another party. Uh, so you have a much bigger impact on, th on the future of the world because you do choose, you pick up the winners and you finance innovation. And that's a, a, a privilege to be able to uh, basically influence the way the world is developing by putting money where you want to have a solution to a problem. And especially in deep tech topics, it's all about finding solutions to real life problems. And that's why I find this asset class so fascinating, 
but it's not very well known. We have a cultural issue in Europe. We, we don't really know what it is. I mean, other countries like the US have understood it fully and uh, throughout the world as well. I think we have a bit of education to do about this asset class and that will make easier to fund the vehicles, the venture capital vehicles, but also eventually as well the startups. I think if we do education here, one thing you should change is the naming. The translation of venture capital in German is Risiko Kapital. So if I invest into a risk, this is what Europeans do, but the US guys they invest into a cool venture, they build something. And if you, if you want to change the attitude, I think we should get rid of this risk in front of the capital and have something more entrepreneurial, right? Absolutely. I mean, you should either spell the original term, venture capital, it's all about adventure. Venture has always an opportunity in, in, the, in the concept. Or in French, innovation capital or innovations capital. This is what it is all about. It's not about the risico capital per se or capital risk. Because, I mean, if you invest, if you put all your money in one single house uh, here downtown Zurich, it might be more risky than a well diversified VC portfolio, I can tell you. But you know, this is super important because most investors view risico capital as something not just risky, but also shady, you know, it's kind of hedge fund. You, you, do, uh, uh, you do play with the money and you have 90% uh, risk to lose it all. This is not true. I mean, it's something serious. It has a fundamental impact on those societies. And uh, a well diversified fund is not that risky after all. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I read this book, you tell a lot about stories of very solid Swiss ventures. I mean, the big mm -hmm. ones, Nestle and so on, but also so-called hidden champions like mm -hmm. Sensirio. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the hidden champion, hidden champion is in Switzerland? Yes, so you may know this concept of hidden champions. It comes from Germany. I was coined uh, to describe the KMU sector, uh, which is uh, very strong in German-speaking countries, but also obviously in Switzerland. Those have been the super successful tech companies in the last 200 years, uh, which have made Switzerland rich, and also south of Germany as well. And, and typically those hidden champions, they are not well known. They are discreet, they start in a village, they are very techy, it's all about uh, precision, it's all about quality. And they, they have been self-financed with the, uh, typically the family or the local banks. And that model has been super successful the last 200 years. But the big question is, how will this model evolve in a world which gets digitalized? Because now it's competing with another type of innovation, and those are direct competitors, who are financed by venture capital. And venture capital is an open platform, uh, $600 billion every year to be a free disposal. You do what you want with it. And you get the best talent from the world, wherever they come from, or best investors on the platform. And it gets allocated to the very best investors with the you know, kind of category leaders take it all. So they get uh, an, incre an increasing amount of capital, the more successful they, they, they are. And it's almost more or less free money. So my big question for Switzerland as a whole is how can we make sure that Switzerland, the Swiss model of entrepreneurial, which was in the past, as I said, family uh, or, and um, privately financed, how can it compete in a, an open digital led platform um, world and we've seen it, uh, it's difficult in uh, all the digital topics. We've lost the game. I mean, Europe has only 2% of the big tech's market cap versus 80% the US. So uh, you, you can see uh, Europe has missed the digital transformation opportunity. And the same challenge is for Switzerland. And eventually it will challenge the current uh, companies where, where Swiss, Switzerland is very good, like uh, the, um, technology firms, the ABBs, the, even the Nestle's, the banks, it's all getting disrupted by digital platforms which have got this venture capital financing to compete with. So it's a wake-up call for Switzerland to use this venture capital asset class more effectively to compete against international competition. So basically what you're saying is we have everything that is needed to be successful but 
the venture capital scene is not yet very mature and it's not at the right no. size. And it's probably linked to the fact that we've been so successful with the old model, which was a kind of family uh, circle where you had access to top universities like ETH, uh, PFL. Everything was smoothly and it's a privilege of rich countries. Mm -hmm. So with that model, you can, you can be successful. But this is not enough for the future. And venture capital should not be underestimated. If you take the top 10 uh, global cap, I mean, uh, global companies in terms of market cap, eight out of those top 10 have been venture capital backed. Uh, and that means venture capital has transformed the world already. And uh, it's important that, to, uh, that Switzerland also catch the wave. So with more venture capital, we could make these hidden champions move much faster, I guess. Yes. And also internationalize them much earlier. Now, talking about Swisscom Ventures, I mean, Swisscom is a telco provider, uh, by far the largest one here. Why do they need mentoring? Well, when I joined, there was 350 people in the innovation department. 350 20, people doing innovation? 20 years ago. Today, there are none. I mean, we just closed the last 10 uh, so you departments. Kick, you kicked them out or they left? No, all the <laughs> innovation went outside. It's all about open innovation. Yeah. So you don't source your next innovation from the internal department anymore, as you used to do 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, the Bell Labs uh, all, and the telecom groups did invent many of the internet uh, basic modules. But it's got all inter externalized and venture capital financed. So uh, again, we, we, that's what people have to realize. Innovation, disruptive innovation in particular, does not happen in large groups anymore. So you see Switzerland puts 22 billion Swiss francs per year R&D, only 3 million in commercializing this R&D, that's venture capital. Mm -hmm. Other countries have flipped the model. Like Israel puts 10 million only in R&D, but 30, so 10 times more than in Switzerland, 30 million in venture capital. So they are much efficient, much more efficient at exploiting the fruits and the outcomes from the research departments. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's good that the Swiss and Switzerland has been very R&D led, which is great. Let's, let's continue this path. I'm not challenging the R&D model. I'm just saying to the institutional uh, partners, why don't you exploit what comes out of your R&D labs a bit better, put more money at risk in venture capital, and that's how you create the technology champions of tomorrow. Now, talking about venture capital of Swisscom, you have raised several funds. Can mm -hmm. you give us an indication of the total size of these funds and where the money came from? So, we've got the last, last two funds, external funds, are 200 and 300 million large, I mentioned. 20 institutional investors, about 15 pension funds, and a few family offices. 15 pension funds? Yes. But typically pension funds tell they don't go into venture capital. So you have maybe a secret recipe here to get pension funds to invest more in venture capital it, funds? It, it was a tough call, I must say. It's not an obvious it's, story. It's because itself. of your book, maybe. <laughs> no, not, not at all. No, it's, I mean, people understand eventually the story that if we don't invest in the future, uh, and venture capital is an excellent uh, way to do it. Some, something will happen. In, in, some, they have a sense of responsibility to, uh, to invest in Switzerland, but most pension funds are not used to do it. They don't know how to do it. So you have to provide the right vehicle, which makes them comfortable investing into this new asset class. Typically, they would do it via fund of funds who would invest in the US. Mm -hmm. Now we are offered an alternative so it was, you know, we had 15 years of experience. Uh, we had a team. Uh, Swisscom is a reassuring brand. We have access to Swisscom's uh, commercial and technology channels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all put together makes, makes it a viable value proposition. So you say they invested because you basically convinced them it's the right thing to do and you made them interesting packages because it's together with the big telco. It's, yes. Some other arguments you could bring in? They do really want to do something for Switzerland. They are financial investors, so you need to deliver good returns, yeah. but that's not enough. To have the additional um, ecosystem development idea behind is the emotional part, which they will never admit they do this. They do it for the returns. But um, I think you need both uh, aspects. And we'd love to see this much, much more because in the past, always 
had this weird idea that basically the money from my pension fund goes into my competition of the startups that I invest in here. Mm -hmm. Because they, they invest in international um, venture funds, which then invest in US startups, which are going to compete with my European startups. And that's a little weird if my money works against myself. Say, same for large corporates, of course. And, and typically with a 1 to 10 ratio in terms of size in the mega rounds, the late stage rounds determine who are the... I mean, they are kingmakers, so they determine who are the category leaders. And typically, uh, you have, uh, for the same uh, technology, you've got a few teams competing at early stage, pretty much level. But at some stage, one team, typically the US, gets 10 times more money than a European or a Swiss team. Who will win, do you think? I mean, one will consolidate the other, and, and money does help. So we don't want to have that... Mm -hmm. uh, process fueled by, as you said, your own money, and, and Swiss, yes. ha Swiss have got a lot of money, and we should, we should fuel into the system. Great. So just in case the audience has any questions, you're totally free to interrupt, hold up your hand, and then somebody with a microphone will come and pick up the question. We just continue with the discussion, of course, but if you do have questions, you're very much welcome to chime in and grill us on stage. Now, May I add yeah. something? Please. You know, when you talk to institutional investors, it's all about money and returns. They typically believe Switzerland has got lower returns than the US. That's, um, you know, people would think because it's a smaller market, people don't talk about Googles and we don't have a huge uh, exit. But I mean, if you take the top 100 exits in the last 50 years in this country, 10 billion has been invested in venture capital and about 80 billion has been returned or you know, market cap created. So you see, it has been a very successful investment topic, but nobody knows about it because 80% of the money invested in, in this country comes from abroad, typically from international VCs. And if you take the, the top winners, the, the, the best uh, companies coming out of this ecosystem, you, you land at 90, 95% of the money comes from abroad. So if you want to find people who've made a lot of money with Swiss ventures, uh, you typically go to the US, you find, uh, have been approached by a few people, they say, oh great, I did great business in Switzerland. Uh, yeah. you, you find more peop people who got rich through those investments uh, abroad than in Switzerland, yes. except, except now, now with SIGTIC and the business angels getting into the game, that's very healthy to have a circular economy, and that's super important uh, to, to increase that uh, investment. I mean, we try to turn every founder who has an exit into a funder, mm -hmm. join the community and help others. That, that's uh, the big goal that we have, because we think those people that just did it, they can help the most. Now, in your book, you have an interesting section. If I go to the back pages, look at this. Suddenly, the pages turn dark blue from, from like normal. So something is special about the last part of the book, and it, it's quite extensive, and it's a secret recipe I heard, how to spend 50 billion on mm. Swiss startups. Can you tell us what these dark blue pages mean? Well, the idea is to set a target, an ambition for this country. As you remember, we invest three billion every year. It's, it's 10 times more than what used to be 10 years ago. It was about 300 million venture capital invested. So it, on one hand, you could say it's great, fantastic, lots of money, but this is only 0.5% of the total venture capital market. So the, uh, you know, we, a relative, our relative market share in Switzerland has decreased the last couple of years. We should not forget that. Let's not be, um, you know, let's not believe that uh, it's always, uh, getting better relative to other countries, uh, we are losing market share. We are about 20, top 25 cluster in the world, size-wise, but it's projected that in eight years' time, by the end of this century, of this uh, decade, uh, 100 cities in the world will have more than 3 billion venture capital. So we, uh, Switzerland might end up in a position 120, 130, ranking uh, behind many other cities. So we have to be ambitious enough 10 billion per year seems to be like uh, an achievable uh, amount. So we should triple the current investment into Swiss cars from 3 billion to up to 10. Correct. Mm -hmm. And per there year. is a direct relationship between the amount you put in and what you get. So typically 1 billion you invest in an ecosystem, one unicorn you get out of it. 
the rough uh, rule of thumb. For one billion of venture capital, only one unicorn. Yes. And so if you put 50 billion in this market over the next eight years, uh, you should get 50 uh, unicorns. And, and I split 10 moonshots, so 10 areas where Switzerland could be a category leader or world class, typically associated with high precision tools, high precision artificial intelligence. So for example, uh, you're calling uh, personalized medicine, personalized uh, agriculture, uh, deep tech topics. We won't be the category leaders in B2C uh, topics where marketing budgets play a big role, but we can be very good in uh, scientific-led innovation. So that's why, by the way, Get Your Guide mm -hmm. and WeFox, which are the two largest B2C uh, um, exit or at least uh, success. Yep. Uh, in this country, they went to Berlin to get access to money. So sure. let's focus on, on as an ecosystem on what we, where we can be in the top three worldwide. It might be niches, sometimes might be bigger uh, categories. And uh, typically what I did is over those 10 topics, 10 moonshots, I tried to see how much money could be allocated on each segment and what can come out of it. So basically it's a master plan for your 50 billion fund that is coming, or where should the money come from, the 50 billion? It's, it's, a, it's a clearly a community exercise. Uh, it's partly from your own um, yeah, we early give stage flow, fund. But we, we can't give you the 50 billion. <laughs> you see, if, if the country wants it, we'll get it. The money is there. So it starts with, in other countries, you have a sovereign fund, technology sovereign fund. So we've been pushing this topic uh, pretty hard with, with, with politicians. I've had a number of discussions with politicians the last few months. Some uh, do call me to ask, you know, to get education and trained about venture capital. Yep. It's an interesting process. And for example, uh, this month, the uh, Federal Council will let us know if a process will start to create a technology fund for Switzerland, one billion or more. So I hope that is a first step. But more importantly is individual action of pension funds, um, family offices, um, corporates. And if we all believe this is important for the country, if we all believe it's a good way to make money, and it's a very good for impact because that's how we can solve some of the world uh, most acute problems for the environmental issues. If, if we understand all these positive externalities, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to, 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 to invest more money in, in the space. So I also read that, that the SECO, the Swiss government uh, part, look, which looks into economic affairs, basically, that they do a study now, whether they should do a fund or not, and why they would do a fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, Federal Chancellor Guy Parmelin, He's mm -hmm. very much in favor of it. Mm -hmm. But some other people say, why should the state interfere? There's no market failure. Mm -hmm. Or is there a market failure with venture capital here? Look, the other countries like uh, Temasek in Singapore, which is a liberal country you know, mm -hmm. from an economic point of view, they've done a, a real success out of it. Uh, Temasek is a sovereign fund, 150 billion under management and 14% ARR. IR, that means over 20, 14% in the last 30 years. So they're making over 20 billion of profit with this sovereign fund. So it's not, it's not just about uh, subvention and, and you know, something which costs money. It's a real strategic asset for the country. Look, ask the Israeli, when they started their, prob their venture capital industry, they, it all started also with uh, state intervention. Your SMA program, uh, the European Investment Fund is doing great work in, in Europe. If you didn't have the European Investment Fund to fund 40% of the venture capital industry in the EU, the industry will not exist. Mm -hmm. So frankly, I don't understand why the Swiss don't do it. So it just works too good to not do it? Probably. I think it's not a market failure, maybe it's more a missed opportunity, right? But maybe politicians are not paid to cap capture opportunities. They're maybe paid to de-risk and to stick to certain rules that uh, mm. other people made in the past. Maybe we should break the rules a little bit. We have to. Um, any questions from the audience? We still have like six minutes for the panel. Yeah, uh, maybe the microphone. Yeah, please, Daniel. George has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dominique, for a very insightful uh, information. A quick question on 
the perception about the Swiss ecosystem. If you look at the index published by WIPO, mm -hmm. uh, which ranks Switzerland number one country in the world mm -hmm. in the global innovation mm -hmm. for the last 11 consecutive years, Sweden being number two, United States being number three. And taking this into consideration about, and your perspective, do you have any comment why this is not impacting, I think, the ecosystem here? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good point, which illustrates the Swiss excellence in R&D. But, you know, it's not enough. You need to follow the process into commercializing this R&D. So you may have patents, you may have a, a lot of good research, but this is not exploited to the full extent it could by uh, ventures. And that's why um, uh, we need to change. In the old days, when innovation was kept inside corporates or state departments, it was not such a problem because you could uh, cr invent and, and almost commercialize lots of things. I mean, you had uh, a system in place, especially in rich countries, to make it work. But now that you're competing against you know, open innovation with uh, people from all over the world, uh, you have to adapt and adjust your model. So innovation alone is not enough. We need to commercialize mm -hmm. it somehow. Now, Corporate venturing is all about putting a corporate close to innovation, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, it goes in waves, typically. When the economy goes well, they mm -hmm. have too much money, then they start the corporate venturing and all great. But when the economy goes down, like right now, we heard this morning, um, there will be a long recession, maybe, which will not be a fast uh, uh, thing to recover fast, fast from. Now, will not all corporate ventures stop doing what they did in the last 20 years, or, or will they continue? And what, what will uh, Swisscom do? Uh, that's precisely w what happened in the past and will happen if you don't get the big picture. If it's all about short-term returns, mm -hmm. you may stop it. It's not essential for corporate survival to have corporate venturing. But if you're building a 50 billion ecosystem, as we said before, if you know that eventually you might have 50 unicorns coming out of it, uh, 50 category leaders. I mean, this is such a, an exciting uh, program that the corporates uh, should feel committed to it. In, uh, that's for their own sake as well, because that's how you create local innovation and you develop your own uh, business, your own market. So for Swisscom, for example, we've invested in uh, 78 companies, half of them in Switzerland, and all of them have jobs, I mean, about 2,500. Mm -hmm. They use Swisscom services. They, some of, us, of them partner with us. That's how you develop Swisscom's business as well. But again, if it's only the small story, small details, you can go up and down and fail and stop, uh, so-called stop and go, and that's a big problem. If you get the big picture, corporate should be the first to lead the way into long-term investment in venture capital because they are the, the, the ones who get most benefit from it, eventually. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the managers in the big corporates to have a long-term vision, not just a, a quarterly vision with quarterly mm -hmm. results, but maybe have whatever, 10 years, or what's the right mm -hmm. time horizon? 15 years? It, it goes uh, progressively from three to 10, we'd say. Uh, let me just give you one example. Take the Chinese example. Uh, but 15 years ago, there was no venture capital in China and they were fully uh, missing on the digital transformation side. And what they decided is to create a venture capital industry. And it went so fast in, within five years that they overtook even the European, uh, sorry, the American um, venture capital scene uh, during one year. And it all happened through corporates, nothing from the state. It was only corporates, because the corporates like Tencent, Alibaba, and so on, and even the, the energy um, people, the state, uh, the state uh, corporates, they started investing up to 100% of their cash flows into ventures. Mm -hmm. So that's how they put up to 100 billion a year into the system, into the ecosystem, and ended up with creating an industry. Uh, I may, as an anecdote, I was talking with my peer, head of uh, corporate venture at Tencent, and he told me, uh, uh, I'm asking him, you know, how much do you have in the management in your portfolio? And he said, well, 150 billion. And I asked, you know, do you mean uh, local currency? And he said, no, no, dollars. I mean, yeah, can you imagine within yeah. six years, 
150 billion worth of assets because they put 100% of their cash flows into venture capital. In the Europe, it's about 1%. Switzerland, uh, also 1%. Swisscom, also below 1%. So, so we still see have a lot to learn in this respect. There's actually one crash in the audience, which we want to take before we close down the panel. Dominic, this is, this yes. is Jan. Uh, thank you very much for reminding us here in Switzerland for, for the last 200 years how the technical innovation was financed. But I think you're missing one point, is the banks. The banks were a lot of financing these uh, family businesses in these villages that you uh, talked about. I, I absolutely agree, I and I mentioned the local banks uh, previously, not just the family, absolutely. And that's where we see the link here. The, for that innovation, you can't rely on banks because it's too early stage. Banks were financing. For the last 200 years, banks were financing a lot of these family uh, started businesses. Yes. Even though they were relatively shaky, they were relatively international for these, um, for these times. Yeah. They were exporting into the, into the wilder world. Mm -hmm. And there is a funding gap now that we have Basel I, we have Basel II, yeah. we have Basel III. So essentially, the, the banks are regulated to no longer mm -hmm. take risks. Exactly. And there is a funding gap in the, mm -hmm. in the economy. Have you ever try to uh, determine how big the funding gap is, if you look at the last 100 years maybe, because a lot of these companies that today are still the pride of industrial Switzerland, I don't know, ABB maybe, uh, as one example, they were heavily financed by banks throughout mm -hmm. the entire development cycle. Mm -hmm. how, much, how much money would we need to pump into the Swiss uh, venture capital system to maintain the same uh, level of, uh, of development and of advancement um, that these banks used to finance? Thank you. In relative terms, six times more money than today. That's basically the gap between US and Europe over the last 15 years. You say six times yes. more? Yes. US has been historically investing six times more money than European in venture capital. And for me, this is the gap because all the rest is equal, but the same R&D budget, same number of uh, I mean, uh, Nobel Prize winners in scientific matters, even more on, on the European side, almost 50% of the European uh, scientific um, topics. But you only have 2% market share. It's because Europe only invested six times less venture capital than the US. And that gap has to be filled. And I take it as a relative measure. It's not about absolute terms, because this year, for example, or last year, Europe invested 100 billion, which is as much as the US five years ago. But in between, the US uh, increased their stake to 300 billion. So you see, uh, relative to competition, because it, it, we are in competition, uh, we have to have a level uh, I would say, equilibrium between US, Europe, and Asia. Excellent. And with that, we're at the end of the panel. Let's thank Dominic Megre for all the insights. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for coming on stage. Please.